Hello guys and welcome to another session that we are going to have now. So in this session, what we are doing is that we are going to have a walkthrough of a very, very recent paper. In fact, at the time of the making of this video, this is going to be the most recent paper that we have. And this is good because obviously it's going to also give us some sort of an indication of what could be assessed, but also it's great for practice. So what we're doing in this one is not really a solution because I won't be solving all of this uh, live along with this video. Rather, I've solved this before and I'll really just be going through my solution and I'll be explaining to you my thought process. This is how the video is going to go. And obviously, this is also going to help you guys save time because it's obviously going to be much, much faster than me just doing it uh, and writing everything out by hand in class. So let's get started with this paper. All right. So question number one, a figure 1.1 1 .1 is a speed time graph for the first five minutes of a bus journey. Now, since this is a speed time graph, this is the same analysis that you do in O or in A levels. First of all, you think about for a speed time graph, what do you know, what data does any features of this graph give us? So I know that for this graph, I know this idea that the gradient of a speed time graph is going to be acceleration. And I also know that the area under this graph is going to be distance. Now this might seem like an overly simplistic step to do, but this actually does help you in a lot of cases to avoid really silly errors, right? So do this every time that you have a question, be it an MCQ or be it a structured question. And it doesn't even, even depend on what level of education you're in. If this is O levels or in A levels, you do the same thing every time. So this is the speed time graph. The first part says, describe the motion between t equals to 0.9 minutes and 2.9 minutes. So this is 0.9, this is 2.9 minutes. And you can see that this is the constant value, right? So since this is a speed time graph, the speed is constant at whatever this value is. So I'll say constant speed. Now if somebody, they, for example, they did not write this down, then they could have a tendency to forget that this is a speed time graph and maybe they write down something which would be relevant to a distance time graph. So maybe for, if this was a distance time graph, instead of speed, maybe if this was distance, then you could end up saying that since distance is not changing, you could say this is at rest, but this is what you do not have to do here, right? So it's really important to identify the type of graph you're dealing with. Next, between 2.9 and 3.5 minutes. So this part has also been marked here. So 2.9 and 3.5. So the speed is decreasing and it's at a constant rate. So I've written constant deceleration, right? This is like the most concise term you could use to describe what's happening here. And then from 3.5 to 4.5 minutes, you can see that the speed is zero. So the object is at rest or it is stationary or it's not moving. All of these mean the same thing. Part B, another bus travels at a speed of 8.9 meters per second. The brakes apply a constant force and the bus stops in a distance of 23 meters. The bus has a mass of 18,000 kg. Calculate the kinetic energy of the bus before the brakes applied. So you have mass, you have speed. All you need to use is this formula. So I'm guessing that there is just a mark for saying KE equals half MV square. And then the next one is just for using it with the values provided and finding out the correct answer. So 712890 is what it was turning out to be. So to 2SF, if you write this, this is 710,000, right? Or you could also do this to 3SF, in which case it would be 713,000. Calculate the force required, the force applied to stop the bus. Now, when I saw the word force, I'm thinking about F equals MA. But the problem is I know the mass, but I do not know the acceleration. So then I obviously can't find force 
either. So in this case, what you had to identify is that the kinetic energy is basically lost because this bus, which is, uh, which was traveling at this speed, the brakes are applied and then it stops, right? So it's at rest now. So when it's at rest, this means that now the kinetic energy has all become zero. So all of the kinetic energy is now gone. So the thing you need to identify then is that it had some kinetic energy initially and now it's all gone. Now there is no energy. So this loss in kinetic energy, where has this come from? So this is because of the work done by that braking force, by the friction, which really acted on the bus to stop it. So initially it was 710,000 and finally it's none. So that's also the change equals to the work done. So the force times the distance moved in the direction of the force. So F the force 23 is the distance, right? Because it stops in a distance of 23 meters. And then you just find out F. So writing this to 2SF, this turns out to be 31,000 newtons. So that's question number one. Question number two, a define impulse. So the way impulse is defined that this is the force times the time for which the force acts. There is no problem in writing this equation in this way, where you have a multiplication sign in the middle. This is something that the examiner does accept. 2.1 shows a rocket and its exhaust gases. Exhaust gases are emitted from the rocket with a velocity of 1400 meters per second and at a rate of 2,800 kg per second. Show that the force exerted on the rocket by the exhaust gases is 3,900 kilonewton. State the equation you use. All right. So obviously this is giving this hint to me that if you want to calculate the force, we know that the equation is the rate of change of momentum. So change in momentum over change in time. However, this is a case where the velocity is constant. So the exhaust gases are emitted with some velocity, which is not changing, but the rate which is given is of 2,800 kgs per second. So each second, 2,800 kg of exhaust gases are expelled from this rocket. Now, because I know the equation is this Delta MV over Delta T. So that's change in MV over the change in time. Now, because V is not changing, I can really take this out. If you can treat this as brackets. So it's V times Delta M over Delta T and Delta M over Delta T is what was really given to us here. Technically, this is called the mass flow rate. So 2800 kg per second is Delta M over Delta T, this entire thing. And your speed was just 1400. You just multiply them. You get this exactly. And to 2SF, that becomes 39,000 kilonewton. Calculate the maximum mass that this force can lift from the ground, ignore air resistance. So for the max mass, think about it this way, that you know that this force that we calculated is the force exerted on the rocket by the exhaust gases. Now, this is really an application of Newton's third law that whatever force the rocket exerts on the exhaust gases by expelling them downwards, the exhaust gases apply an equal and opposite force on the rocket in propelling it upwards. So it can lift some mass off the ground, but what would be the max mass is that if the weight is such, if the weight is such that it's entirely equal to this thrust, which is produced by the expulsion of those gases. Now, if this force was somewhat, if this weight was somewhat less, so this could pick it up, but additionally, it would also accelerate, right? If this weight was slightly less then whatever maximum value could happen. But because this force is equal, because we're talking about the max mass so at the largest possible value of the weight. Both of these forces would be equal. So T and W would be equal so that there is no acceleration and the rocket is just rising upwards at constant speed, right? So this is the idea that we use here. So the force we just calculated, if we just set this equal to the weight, which is Mg, 
and we just set it equal to this value that we calculated. G is 9.8, we just divide and find out the mass, which is this value. And to 2SF, if we write this, this becomes 400,000. Question number three, a car has a weight of 13,000 Newton. The car is supported by four tires. Area of each tire is given then. So this is the area of each tire in contact with the road is given as this value. Calculate the pressure on the road due to the weight of the car. Now, again, it's really obvious that we have to use the definition of pressure force over area, but the area here is of each tire. You have four tires. So you just find the total area by multiplying and you get this answer and writing this to two SF, you get this value. Part two, explain in terms of particles, why the air pressure in the tires increase when the car travels along the road. So if you're, if this is your first session with me, then it's time that you also know that I, whenever doing a yearly paper, I always talk about one of the hardest parts, which are out there. This, in my opinion, was a contender for that hardest part award, but it really didn't manage to win another part managed to win as we'll see later. So you have to explain why in terms of particles, the air pressure increases when the car travels along the road. So in this case, the first thing that you had to identify was that when we're talking about the car traveling along the road, there's going to be friction acting. This is the first thing. How do I even know I'm supposed to talk about this is because pressure is increasing. Right? So my pressure here is going up. And if you have a really good grip on your gas laws, you know, this can only happen in one of two ways, which is that if the temperature goes up or if the volume goes down. Now, obviously here, nothing is going to happen to the volume. So I end up in somehow linking this to the temperature. And for the temperature, I know that the way that the temperature of the tires can go up is because of its movement of the car along the road, which is going to lead to friction. So first you say that the friction between the road and the tire causes the temperature of the air in the tires to go up, right? It, uh, the friction causes the heating effect. And then you write the stuff related to molecules, which is that particles move faster, right? Temperature goes up. So the kinetic energy increases and they collide more frequently. So this is the keyword that you have to write in every scenario where you have to explain the impact on pressure. So they collide more frequently with the walls of the tire and exert a greater force, right? So this is how you write this entire answer. All right. A gas cylinder contains helium gas at a pressure of two into 10 to the six pascals a volume of 0 0.026 meter cube of this compressed gas. So at this pressure and this volume, this gas is released from the cylinder into balloons. Each balloon contains 0 0.015 meter cube of helium at atmospheric pressure. The temperature remains constant. This thing alone that the temperature remains constant is your hint that you have to use this equation. Right? P1, V1 equals to P2, V2. So whenever we talk about PV, uh, pressure and volume, the third thing, which is the temperature has to be constant. Calculate the max number of balloons that can be filled. So in this case, what we have is we obviously know we have to use the equation P1, V1 equals to P2, V2. But let's pause and read this question again. So I have some initial pressure. I know the volume of the gas initially as well. And then this is released and this goes into balloons of which we also know the pressure. We also know the volume. So the question is that what should we really even find here? The idea is that this is of each balloon, right? So for first, what we can do here is that we can find out what is the total volume corresponding to all the balloons, right? I know that whatever this final volume is, it's going to be, it's going to be at the same atmospheric pressure, one into 10 to the five Pascals. So first what I do is that using this equation, 
I have my initial pressure. I have the initial volume. I have the final pressure. I find out the new volume, which is the total volume of air at this new value of the pressure, right? So this turns out to be 0.52 meters cube. But the idea is that this 0.52 meter cube is not the volume of one balloon. It's the volume of some n number of balloons and each balloon has a mass of 0 0.015 meter cube. So here on out, I just use the unitary method to find out the number of balloons. Now, the number of balloons turns out to be 34.67. This is asking for the max number of balloons. If you fill 34 and a half balloons, this means that you did not fill the 35th balloon, right? You only filled 34 full balloons. So in this case, technically, this answer is supposed to be rounded down, not rounded off. So this is not going to be 35. It's going to be 34, right? So for example, if you have eight slices of pizza, and if you have to distribute them along, let's say nine people, right? So everybody can only get a maximum of one entire slice, right? So think about it like this. It has to be a whole number. So it can't be 35. It can only be 34. So in this case, you had to round down. All right, next one. Define specific heat capacity, really straightforward. Energy required per unit mass, per unit temperature rise. It doesn't matter if you swap this order around. So if you say per unit temperature rise, per unit mass, that's also fine. A volume of 0 0.024, 0 0.0024 meter cube of oil is heated in a pan for seven minutes. Temperature of oil increases from 20 degrees Celsius to 180 degrees Celsius. Density of oil is given as this. Specific heat capacity is given like this. Calculate the mass of oil in the pan. So rho equals m over v is your equation. And you can make mass the subject and you can find out what this is. Because you know the density, you know the volume. Now you know the mass. In the next part, you have to find the energy required to increase the temperature of the oil. So you know the mass. You know the specific heat capacity. And using these values, you can find the rise in temperature. So mass was 2.2. C is 2000 and 180 minus 20 is that rise, which is 160. Multiplying all of this out, you get this exactly. If you write in it in 3SF, this would also work. If you want to do this to 2SF, this is what you would say, 700,000. Part three, calculate the power required to supply the energy calculated in B2. So this is the energy and here we were also given the time, which is seven minutes, right? So if I want to give my answer in watts power equals energy over time, so I know that the SI unit for time is not minutes, it's seconds. So I should ideally convert this to seconds by multiplying by 60, and then it's just simple division, which gives me the answer, 1700 watts. If somebody did use seven, then that answer could also be acceptable if they did not write watts and if they wrote joules per minute as a unit, then it would be acceptable. But if you write watts there, then it's going to be wrong. Question number five, table 5.1 shows applications of regions of the EM spectrum. Complete the second column of the table with the region of the EM spectrum use for each application, choose from the regions in this list, gamma, infrared, microwaves, radio waves, ultraviolet. Each, re each region may be used once, more than once, or not at all, right? So maybe there is something which is left out and that's not going to be a problem. They, maybe it's the case that not all of these are used. So you need to have your pick from these five options. So first one, it says cancer treatment, it's gamma rays. Bluetooth data connection, it could be microwaves, but theoretically speaking, it could also be radio waves. In your syllabus and O-levels, it says uh, Bluetooth as an application of microwaves, but the examiner here was also willing to accept radio waves. Optical fibers, this could only be one possible answer, which is infrared. Security marking is UV. Sterilizing food. 
Now, when I read this question, maybe I thought that sterilizing food, the first thing that came to my mind with sterilization was either gamma or UV. But UV is used to sterilize dental equipment. This is one of those applications. But for food, we use gamma rays. And wireless internet is microwaves. State the approximate speed of radio waves in air. So it's 3 into 10 to the 8 meters per second. Part B, 5.1 shows su successive crests of a wave after a plane wave has passed through a gap. On 5.1, draw three successive crests before the wave reaches the gap. So you must draw, and the question is also hinting this, uh, that you have to draw a plane wave. So you have straight wave fronts. The important idea to keep in uh, mind here when drawing this is diffraction does not change the wavelength of a wave. So ideally, the spacing that you have here should also be the spacing here. If, for example, let's say you maybe messed up this drawing and you feel like your answer, your drawing is not reflecting that the wavelength is not supposed to change, just mark it here. Say that this is also lambda and this length is also lambda. For my case, this looks approximately equal. So all's good here. 5.2 shows a much wider gap. A plane wave of the same wavelength as in B1 is incident on the gap from the left side of the barrier. On 5.2, draw three successive crests of the wave after the wave has passed through the gap. So you don't need to draw anything before. You've already shown that in the previous part. You just need to draw what it looks like after when the gap size is now much larger. So in this case, the idea is that because of the gap size being so large, if you did have these plane waves coming in, the part in the middle would not even really experience diffraction. So it wouldn't really bend. Only the parts near to the edges are the ones which would bend. So in this case, I would draw a diagram, some curvature like this, right? So think about it this way, that the waves here are going to bend in this and in this direction. Right, so this is how they are going to bend. The ones in the middle, they are going to stay straight. Similarly here, you are going to have something like this. Do make sure that again, your answers do show that the wavelength is approximately the same. And then here, it's going to be probably something like this. Right, so this is how you draw the wave fronts in this case. As you can see, as we go on, to more and more wave fronts, the amount of curvature is increasing here, right? Initially you have less curvature and then it increases. 6.1 shows a full scale diagram of an object O and its image I produced by a converging lens. Lens and its position on the principal axis are not known. So initially you did not have all of this stuff here. Let's remove this for now. This is what the question was. On 6.1, draw a single ray to locate the position of the center of the converging lens. So in this case, I know that the easiest ray to make, which is also what you should do when provided a ray diagram to make, the easiest one is just to draw this one, which goes through the optical center. That ray is undeviated. So if I make a ray like this, I know that this point where it passes through the principal axis, this is going to be my center. So that's what I do with this purple ray, right? So this is my center. In the next one, it says a line to represent the position of the lens and label the line L. So this is the center. So this is my lens line L. Just uh, take care that you should make this a little, it should be a minimum length long because if you later have to draw this ray, so it, can pass through the lens, right? So just take care of this. For example, if I just drew it like this, then you can see that this is not going to pass through here. So that's just, uh, what I mean to say. Part B, determine the focal length of the lens by drawing another ray on 6.1. So now I use the second ray rule, which is that a ray parallel to the principal axis gets refracted through the principal uh, focus, right? So this is F, 
and then I can just measure this length, which is going to be my focal length. Here it turns out to be 2.1 centimeters. Now, part C, the object has moved 2 centimeters closer to the lens. So if it was 2.1 centimeters here, now I know that maybe this is probably also going to be like this, right? Focal length here, focal length there are both going to be 2 centimeters. So now if this has moved 2 centimeters within, now you can see that the object is at a position where it's going to be between the optical center and F. This is a case where you have a virtual image formation. State two, state two changes to the characteristics of the image. So it's now going to be virtual. It's not going to be real. Because now if you think about it, the way that this uh, would be formed is when you take the rays back, they would intersect at some point, which will lead to a virtual image then, right? So it's not going to be real anymore. And also this image is inverted. This one, as you just saw, is going to be upright now. All right. Virtual and upright, these cases will always happen simultaneously. All right, 7a, draw the circuit symbol for a potential divider. That's how the symbol looks like a resistor. But this uh, arrow shows this movable contact that you can keep at different positions to give rise to different resistances. 7.1 shows a circuit. You have R out, which is 1 kilo ohms variable resistor which you can obviously vary you are you are reading v out at the terminals of r out and you have an emf which is six volts calculate the value of v out when the value of r is three kilo ohms so here because i do not need to find the current i'll just go ahead and use the voltage divided rule the idea with the voltage divided rule is that in the numerator i should have the resistance across which I want the voltage. In this case, it's one kilo ohm because V out is across the one kilo ohm. In the numerator, I need to have the sum of the resistances. Since this is a series circuit, it's really the total resistance. And I just multiply with the EMF. So one kilo ohms, and this is three kilo ohms. So one plus three is four. Again, no conversion needed because both of these would be kilo and they would cancel out anyway times the EMF, which is 6. So 1 over 4 times 6 is 1.5 volts. Value of R is adjusted until the current in the circuit is 1.7 milliamperes. Calculate the charge that flows through the circuit in 300 seconds. So Q equals to IT, right? This is the definition of current. That current is the rate of flow of charge. So just rearranging, I get Q equals to IT. So I have I, which is 1.7 milliamperes. So milli gives rise to the 10 to the negative three. Time is in the SI units, 300 seconds. I just multiply and I get exactly this value as an answer. Again, all the places where you do not have units, this is where you need to write the units yourself. 8A, 8.1 shows a wire carrying a large current. So you have a large current, which is going into the plane of this card. 8.2 shows the square card viewed from above. On 8.2, draw the three magnetic field lines that indicate the direction of the magnetic field and how its strength varies with distance from the wire. So if you look here, you can see that this current is into the plane of the card, as, as I just said. And this is drawn like a cross. So you know that I would now use the right hand grip rule to identify how the direction of the magnetic field is going to be this time around. So in any case that you do have to use the right hand grip tool to find out the direction of the magnetic field lines, the three marks will always be for these three things. The first mark is to just identify that these are going to be concentric circles. What does concentric mean? This means that they should all have the same center. This is what you have one mark for. The other mark is for the correct direction. In this case, if I do point my thumb inwards, and if I wrap my fingers around, I can see that all my fingers go in this direction, which is really clockwise, right? So it's all clockwise like this. So it's clockwise. And the third mark, which people often cheaply lose is to show an increasing spacing. 
between the circles. So because you know that the magnetic field strength is going to fall off with distance, you should show that by an increasing spacing. So what I did first intentionally is that I made the first concentric circle. I made this really small because then it's easy for me to show on the diagram the increases in the spacing. So this is my first one. The second one is slightly further away, as you can see here. If this is the initial distance, this is the new one. And the third one is going to be even further away. Make these diagrams as dramatic as you possibly can. If you, for example, make this diagram in this way, the examiner is not going to mind, honestly. The impact of the increase in the spacing is what should be obvious here, right? If you do make it like this, for example, even if it looks like this, you will lose marks because now this spacing and this spacing are almost equal. It should not be like this. The spacing should increase, right? So this is how your field line should be. The current in the Y increases and the direction of the current is reversed. State how these changes affect the magnetic field. So the current in the Y increases. So this thing is not correct then. So this is an increase in magnitude because the current has gone up. So it's an increase in magnitude because the current is going to also give rise to a stronger magnetic field. So an increase in the magnitude of the field. Let's write it like this. of the field and a reversal in the direction of the current now means that if your thumb was previously pointing down, now it's going to point up. And as a consequence, the direction would now reverse. So previously, if it was going clockwise, now it's going to go the other way around. It's now going to be anti-clockwise. All right, now, so this was uh, the winner of the hardest question contest. In my opinion, this was the hardest question on this entire paper. It says electricity is transmitted at a high voltage. You know, this is true. Explain why a high voltage increases the efficiency of transmission, even with thinner wires. So first off, let's talk about what's the idea of the thinner wire. So a thinner wire means that it's now not going to be as wide. It's going to be thinner, right? What quantity do you know? is changed as an effect of the change in the cross-sectional area of this conductor, that's resistance. So you know resistance is inversely proportional to area, right? So the first thing that you say here is that a thinner wire has a higher resistance. Right? Because area goes down, resistance goes up. Now, why do we transmit at a high voltage? This you also know, because if we think about this equation, P equals to, let's do this in blue as well. We think about P equals to VI. So a high voltage leads to a smaller current. So you know that the lower current leads to less power losses and the equation at play here is this one the power loss through that resistor is given by i square r so a lower current leads to a lower power loss as well but now there are two conflicting changes here if you think about it there's the higher resistance and there's the lower current. Who's going to win here? This is the question you must ask yourself now. Now, the answer to that question is that current is going to win here. And there's this little guy who's making all the difference here. This square on top. Because there's a square Let's say if the current 
halved and the resistance doubled right so they both change by equal and opposite amounts one gets doubled the other one gets halved because of this square here because of this half and because of this two the impact of this would be greater because it's also going to be squared right this is exactly the idea that you also have in play when you're talking about the kinetic energy equation half m v square if here i also make two conflicting changes i say that the mass halves right so the mass halves and the speed doubles right so it's going to be the kinetic energy will also half because of the halving and mass this is just direct proportion but it's proportional to the square of the speed so now it's not just going to double it's going to be 2 squared times its value so overall the kinetic energy will increase by a factor of 2 that's the same idea which is also at play here so you'll say that the change in current is greater or let's say like let's write like this that the decrease in current outweighs the increase in resistance because of the square term pausing so power would also ultimately decrease so causing power dissipated to decrease never in your answers especially in physics shy away from using an equation as a means of aiding your response this is what you should do in any scientific conversation right so if you even write an equation the examiner will give you marks for it provided you flesh it out to some extent so this was the hardest question on this paper question number nine a an experiment directs alpha particles at a very thin sheet of gold foil. Most of the alpha particles pass through the thin foil in a straight line. State the conclusion about the atoms from this observation. With alpha scattering, you should have each observation corresponding to a certain conclusion. If most of the alpha particles are going straight through, if they are not deflecting at all, this means that they don't even experience the presence of the nucleus right which gives rise to this fact that most of the atom is empty space some of the alpha particles are deflected through angles less than 90 and a few are deflected through very large angles greater than almost equal to 180 degrees state and explain two conclusions about the nuclei of atoms from this observation because some of them are deviated through angles less than 90 degrees if they are deflected and you might also remember this shape this diagram if this is my nucleus you know that some particles are deviated like this right so they are deviated away this means that this could only be possible if the nucleus and the alpha particles have the same charges because like charges repel so they are going to be deflected away so this gives rise to this conclusion that the nucleus is positively charged the next one is because only a few particles get deviated through very large angles right this is because only some of them fly so close to the nucleus that they actually bend through they actually just get almost reflected 
So this gives rise to the idea that the nucleus is very small in size. All right. Part B. A source contains a radioactive isotope of strontium. The isotope decays by emission of beta particles. Half-life is given. State the change in the nucleus which occurs when a beta particle is emitted. A neutron turns to a proton. Because it's a nucleus, it can't emit an electron out of nowhere. This happens because of changes in the nucleus, which is when a neutron turns to a proton. You should also know the equation for this, which is this thing here, that a neutron, which is one zero, turns into a proton, which is one one, and releases the beta particle, the electron. How can you remember this is because the nucleon number is conserved, proton number is also conserved. Initial mass of the isotope of strontium in the source is given 25 micrograms. Calculate the mass of the strontium isotope that decays in 87 years. In any question related to half lives, always think about the number of half lives which are elapsing here. Each half life is 29 years. We are talking about a time of 87 years. So 87 over 29, this is three half lives. So initially we will have all of this particle, all of this uh, isotope. And after one half life, this part is going to go away, right? So from 25 micrograms, which was the initial mass, it now becomes 12.5. So I only have this part now. But then this part will also get halved after a half life. So from this part, this one goes away. And then from 12.5, another half, I only have 6.25 of it remaining. And then from this as well, half of it goes away. And I just have this remaining. Whenever doing the half-life calculations, always remember that the number of arrows are the number of half-lives. Because we had three half-lives, you made a diagram with three arrows. But... The most important thing to remember is that this question was asking for the mass of strontium isotope that decays. How much has gone away? It's not asking for how much is left. It's asking for how much has decayed. How much has basically gone away now? Right? If you guys do have problems with half-life, still check out my channel. There's a video which is very comprehensive, covers all the type of half-life questions you could possibly even have. So this is the amount of the mass of the isotope that we had initially at the end. Only this much is left. So just subtracting the two, I get how much has decayed. So 21.875 or 22 micrograms to 2SF. Last question. 10.1 represents different positions A to H of the moon as it rotates around the earth. This diagram, you should also know how to interpret. So you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, all the positions of the moon. State a position of the moon when observer on earth sees A or E. Sees that there is a quarter moon. So this is all the radiation from the sun which is coming in, right? This is all the radiation coming in. Now, where would we have a quarter moon it's only possible if the radiation arrives such that it only illuminates this half as the diagram below was also saying, right? So the one on the left is dark, the one on the right is lit up. That could only be possible in positions A and E, right? This is called a quarter moon, right? So this is a quarter moon. Similarly, if you talk about these positions, C is where this is the new moon because how the radiation is striking here. On Earth, we only see this face, right? Which would not be visible to us because of no radiation striking all of this part. No radiation is here. So this is our new moon, right? This is when we start to see a crescent. This is when we start to see this crescent shape. This is when we see the quarter moon. This is when we see eventually more and more of it. We see a shape like this. This is where we see the full moon. Because now all of the radiation is now reaching. 
right? So at this point, we see the full moon, which is what is asked in the next part, which is G. Similarly, afterwards, I start to see less of the moon uh, from this position G onwards. I see something like this. Then I see another half and then the crescent starts to get smaller again. And then I see the uh, new moon again, which is, a new moon is basically like when you don't see a moon, which is the start of a month. State the approximate time taken for the earth to orbit, uh, time taken for the moon to orbit earth, which is one month. You can also say this, or you can say the days equivalent. So 27, 28, 30, all of these are acceptable. Average distance of earth from sun. So this is not related to the moon anymore. Now it's the sun. This is given as 1.5 into 10 to the 8 kilometers. Calculate the average orbital speed in kilometers per hour. So I don't need to convert the distance. I should just keep it in kilometers as it is. And also because this is per hour. So I should also take care that my time is in hours. This is the equation for the average orbital speed. V equals 2 pi r over t. r is the orbital radius, the average orbital radius, which is the distance. And time is going to be in hours. So a year is the time for a complete orbit of the Earth around the sun. Because my time needs to be in hours, I just multiply it by hours. Each day has 24 hours. I get this value, 2SF, this is 1 10,000. Speed of light in a vacuum is given as this. Calculate the time taken for light from the sun to reach the Earth. In O levels, this is a value that you should know by heart the answer to this, which is 500 seconds, right? Above we, was, above we were given the distance of the Earth from the sun. We know the speed of light. So speed equals distance over time. I need time, so just rearranging. Now here, because this is meters, this distance must also be meters. So I do 10 to the eight, and also to convert this to meters, I do another 10 to the three, right? And then dividing by the speed of light gives me 500 seconds as my final answer. And sorry guys, I lied. There's also another question still left. So 11a state the condition required for a proto star to become a stable star, especially in IGCSE, you must be able to explain the conditions for stability in terms of the different forces. So if this is the star, there's the inward gravitational force of everything which is involved trying to make the star crash in on itself. And because of the nuclear fusion reactions, what power the star, it's trying to make the star expand. For it to be stable, both of these forces must be balanced. But you just can't say forces are balanced. You do need to refer to these forces. So I say this, that the invert force due to the gravitational attraction between all of the mass in the star, which wants to make it collapse inward, that must be balanced by that outward force due to the high temperature caused by the nuclear fusion in the star. Hubble constant, again, this is uh, IGCSE exclusive content. So it's the ratio of speed of recession of galaxy relative to the Earth to distance of the receding galaxy from the Earth. This is the equation, which is Hubble's law. So V equals H naught D. You can also define this as an equation where you say that H naught is V over D, but again, V over D are terms, are symbols that you are using. The examiner has not used them. So then it's also your responsibility to define what these terms mean. So you would write out this expression and then you would say that V is the speed of recession of the galaxy relative to what we see on the earth and d is also the distance of the galaxy from the earth right i just find it easier to write it all in words part two the current estimate for the hubble constant is this much state the equation which gives an estimate for the age of the universe so this is the expression if somebody from this equation if they rearrange it and make one over h not the subject so if i make it the subject that would be equal to d over v so if somebody writes d over v they would also probably get a mark but in this one because it gives me the value for the hubble constant then i know that my expression should involve the hubble constant so this is sort of like a gray area here 
This will only be clarified with time when the official marking keys come out. Part 3 calculate an estimate for the age of the universe. So I have H0. So I just do 1 over H0. This is the time that I get, which is in seconds. Right? So this is the entire paper here. So hope you guys did enjoy this solution and hope this is much clearer to you as opposed to whatever you know related to this paper. So yeah, let me know if you guys have any questions and comments, any parts you would like more clarification on and I'll be happy to help. So thank you guys and best of luck for your exams. Bye.